if the client doesn't like our work, I shouldn't get days being upset and trying to find, figure out why they don't like my work because, you know, I put a lot of heart and thought into my work. But because it's just not aligned with their business strategy or it's just simply they want things their way, you know, and our proposal doesn't fit what they like. Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to another edition of the Design Exchange Podcast. With me today is my friend V Tong, uh, who is the owner of a graphic design company here in Ho Chi Minh City, Vietnam. V, thank you for joining us today. Hello, everyone. My name is V. I'm the founder and creative director of BCA Studio. We are a creative agency that focuses a lot on branding and UX UI design. Good. Well, before we started, uh, we were talking a little bit about your journey. So why don't we just start this off with persistence, the topic of persistence. Go ahead and give us a little bit of a kind of brief history of BCA, of your entrepreneurial journey, and whatever struggles you had along the way. Okay. So um, I'm 100% Vietnamese. And... Uh, but most of my challenge is to work and grow the team in my own uh, hometown. Uh, the reason because I was graduate in Singapore as a visual communication design and I worked there. My first job, I was a web designer for a web agency in Singapore. So after three years working in Singapore, I decided to move back. I want to do something great for myself and for the community and for Vietnam because I see there's a lot of opportunity back there. It was in 2011 that I came back. So eight years already passed. And because I never worked uh, in Vietnam before, there's some different culture gap in a working style. And also, I don't know anybody, right? So I was been away for seven years in Singapore. And the moment I move back, I get to adapt. I have to adapt to like meeting new people here, finding new employee. And to be honest, my first plan was in starting a design agency. So I wanted to open a cafe slash gallery and uh, fashion space. So I was inspired a lot by my journey in Korea and Singapore, where there are a lot more creative space that combine with entertainment. And factions has always been my passion, but I never get to pursue it. But I chose to be in visual graphics instead. And I went back to Ho Chi Minh back then. Uh, the cafe style in Saigon was so different from now. Like now we see a lot of up trendy cafe with modern interior. But back then it's more on like a very outdoor gardening and very simple cafe. And they not even think about anything sophisticated that combine with fashion at the same at that time and Luzin, the popular fashion and cafe chain is not even uh, built yet so there isn't anything like that I face a problem with the business model right like where people don't believe that it's gonna work for Vietnam market eight years ago so then I took on some freelance job and I decided to maybe give it a delay because I was 24 uh, when I came back and I want to figure out what I should do so I want to take time and then I take on some first job is a web design because back then UX UI wasn't even a thing so people just say web design and not many people can do web design so I kind of decided to uh, give it a try and the first project I worked on was very interesting it was for the biggest mobile company here they started to go online and then I worked with the sitcom and now he, they invested in a lot of uh, e-commerce and startup and the, the only F&B they invested is the coffee house so I started with that and then we have a lot of demands so then I start hiring my designer the first designer was working from my parents house so is this already as BCA? yeah so I started with a friend so she kind of buy into the idea that I'm a good designer and there's an opportunity in the market. She's more on the business person. But the thing is, um, she doesn't have any creative background. So the company re relying a lot heavily on me. And 
of course, we're both young. We're the same age with me. We're 24 years old. It's the first business that we do. So after one year, we had a lot of conflict. As you know, like partnership has never been easy. Uh, so she decided to move on. And I was in the middle of one year set up of the company. We invest some money in getting the office already. We have, back then, we have about four employees. It's a very small studio, right? And my team, they don't speak a lot of English. Sometimes I use too much English. It's a problem, right? So I have a bit of a communication gap and working style is a bit different. So I was struggling between closing down the company or, you know, where do this company go? Because I'm in the middle area where we are not really an advertising company. Back then, everyone think design is related with advertising, right? So advertising, we are below the line. We are more branding, uh, marketing design. And then the, the interesting things about us, we also do UX, UI design and web, which is my expertise. And back then, like, not many people have e-commerce website. Uh, Tiki, which is not built yet, right, the, one of the biggest e-commerce platform these days. Now we have like five or six platforms. Back then, there isn't any. Right? So I was struggling to closing down. I was thinking of that. And then I gave it a last shot. So I went to a mobile Monday meetup. So at there, there's a lot of developer there. And I was one of the, the only designer. So one of the speaker, uh, he was an angel investor and he talked about angel investment. He's just, uh, he's a, he's a British with Vietnamese roots. So he gave the talk. I just came up and say hi to him without thinking of anything. I just introduced my company. And then he say, oh, you know, perfect, let's keep in touch. And then he kind of came back uh, after his trip and then we get in touch and he say, you know, like I'm looking for a good design agency. I want to uh, find a partner and then I have a lot of projects for, for this. And I say, okay, so let's give it a try. I wasn't ready for any investment because, you know, like my company is small, we just break even and I was lost my co-founder. And so I was like, all right, so... I'll give you I'll give you our best work. So I work on a project for him and then everything turns out really well. So he decided to bought over the share from my current uh, uh, shareholder and she's left, right? So I have a new angel investor. I have we we set up the new strategy, the new team. And then it's keep going, uh, getting better and better. So we grow the team, but we find our niche. So our niche back then combined with his strength was in the travel segment. So we was very focused on beauty and travel because uh, not many companies can do growth hacking. So he has the growth hacking team. So we, we become a full uh, ecosystem where we're providing not only branding and creative, provide UX, UI, digital marketing, and we growth hack for a lot of travel company in the UK. So we have our niche. And then we develop a lot of UX, UI expertise through that because we build website for travel company and e-commerce company for like beauty and fashion. So we have our own niche. We're pretty uh, doing international work for clients in the UK, Singapore, uh, expats clients here, FMCG, the international background. But we have a pretty reasonable price. So our competitive advantage is that we are 100% local agency but because of my expertise and my partner we can deliver more international standard so we're in the like gray area where we provide good pricing but for more international style of work so we got a lot of demand and then we grow the team there's one period of time i have grown the team to 30 people so that including developers we have in-house developer we also do web development and mobile development as well so 50% of our focus is on the UX, UI design and development. So back then, the team was big. So, you know, had I gave up earlier, then I would not really keep the company until now because that was a really big challenge for me. So I learned to adapt to the working style here, uh, to not giving up that fast and trying to find solution to work around it. And also, it was tough for me as a female founder where uh, here in Vietnam, the parents are kind of putting a pressure on you when you're young, you're at the age of, you know, getting married, these things in Asia, right? And 
you have to prove your success to your parents. Otherwise, they would like, oh, I put so much money in tuition for you to study overseas, and why would you open a cafe? You know, not to say that an agency. Are you able to do it? You're just 24. So my parents was really not supportive of of my ideas. So you know, I was like, I feel like I was alone in this journey, and everything was so tough. But I'm glad that because of the passions and being a bit stubborn at a young age, I'm, I didn't give up, right? So, you know, I stayed through the years. It was a big challenge, yeah. Are you still on, are you still friends with your original founder that you ended up parting ways with? To be honest, uh, the friendships never be close like before because we've been through a lot of things. I guess some other founder will face the same problem. Um, but, you know, I wish her to be successful with whatever she she doing right now. Yeah. I recently parted ways with my business partner in Seifu. Wow, it's not easy, right? I mean, it's certainly awkward. <laughs> I don't really want to meet her because I'm kind of afraid of what awkward communication will end up happening. Yeah, um, it's a part of thing that we cannot avoid, like a ugly breakup. I didn't think we have an ugly breakup, but it's just we are different in the business style and also she doesn't really uh, passionate about design creativity. So it's hard for her to grow a business. As a business development person, she needs to feel passionate about what we do. But it's fair because she's you know, not a design person background. She's more a business side. Yeah. All right. So within, your, within BCA now, the business side of things is that handled by your your business partner, or do you, how much business stuff do you handle? So actually, we are very glad to have a lot of referrals and word of mouth from friends, current client that introduce another client. So we have like good retainers. So clients come to us; they stay through the years. So and they you know order the work every years. So right now on the business development is mostly me who focus on getting new exposure for the company, meeting new people and, you know, consult with them what they should do for their branding. Um, but most of the time we have like good retainer that ordering from us, like big corporation based in Vietnam. So our clients are like uh, Japanese corporation like Yongmo, uh, Biore, on these beauty brands and also travel brand in Singapore and, you know, et cetera. And, you know, a few Singapore clients. So they kind of sustain and, you know, it's very good uh, business model now is get stable. So the next step I would do is to grow the company and changing a little bit of the strategy because we took very long to figure out what is our strength. And we see a missing in the market where design is very subjective. And it's hard for a design agency to take on a bigger scope. So I realized that what we should do is to educate the people here to appreciate design more mm. in a bigger picture, right? So it's important for your daily life. And I believe that you've been to uh, our recent event called Creative Drinks. Right, yeah. Yeah. Last week, this earlier this week. Yeah, exactly. Two days ago, I think, something yeah. like that. Yeah, so we haven't done it for a while, but uh, the three years ago, I started it with the vision that this isn't a playground for local designers to exchange their knowledge and to meet up with startup founders and, you know, SMEs, business people, because there's a big gap between them. They always ask me, where, they, where can I find a good designer? Like, you ask me, where can I find a good video editor? I have resources and I know people of all that. But then the business people who need them doesn't know where to find them. And then the people who want a job doesn't know where to find the, the client, right? So that's why Creative Drinks become a networking platform for both sides to meet and exchange knowledge. So we have like a short talk by industry uh, speakers and people. And then we have the networking time so that everyone can get to know each other. I mean, the last one we had was a bit ambitious where we had very long panel discussion, but usually we have more networking time. Yeah. Uh, How do you think? Do you, do you kind of find that is interesting for you as uh, also people in creative area? Good question. Um, this, might sound, this might 
sound a little petty or or weird, but like for instance, I found uh there was two th two things happening during the event that like made it hard for me to engage with it. One was the uh, I'll probably cut this out. <laughs> but, you know, no uh, one was I think the temperature was too warm. Oh yeah, that's you know something with the venue, right? Yeah. And then also like because the temperature was warm, they like opened up the windows between the upstairs loft and the downstairs area. Uh -huh. So like the jazz music from downstairs was coming in too. Oh, so like okay. there's a kind of the distraction of the temperature and then like the distraction of this jazz music. Mm. And um, and then on top of that, like. I almost didn't go because I was like, oh, I'm so tired. I don't, I just want to stay home and rest. Oh, thanks for coming, so I was like actually. already tired. Yeah. And so I just like, for me personally, I wasn't in a good mental space to really uh, get the most out of the event. If that makes sense. Yeah. It's actually a challenge to find a good space that willing to sponsor for the event and also to, you know, putting everything together in such a short time. We, like, we have like two weeks to prepare for this. So yeah, I, there's a lot of things to organize. Is it because you, 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 you knew that the main speaker was in town and you wanted to yeah, exactly. take advantage of that? Yeah. So he, he just offered to be the speaker. He has a really interesting topic he shared back then. And then I think it would be really have, like useful, interesting for the community. Yeah. The question I didn't get a chance to ask because I had two questions. Like, I, I mean, <laughs> you know, throughout his <laughs> we, talk, I, a second question came out up. Of time. Yeah, right. Um, was okay so just so everyone so give some context the the main speaker at the last creative drinks was talking about voice user interface uh things like how do you interact with siri or alexa or mm, google like assistant how would you design for voice experience and if you were making an app for yeah. those platforms i just get the sense though like people say voice is the future and uh you know, certainly I, there's many times I kind of want that to be true. Like, I don't really like to type messages on my phone anymore. I try to do dictation. Voice control, yeah. So I try to say the message and have it record it. And 20 to 50% of the time I have to make corrections, especially if I'm using like a word that's not necessarily an English word. I see. Like, if I, uh, like what kind of word? <laughs> like maybe a street name in Vietnam. I see. Right? Like, oh, That's we can meet yeah, at this restaurant or at this street. Siri. And okay. it always gets translated into something bizarre. Yeah. That's the language is the biggest challenge anyway for any voice experience uh, designer. Yeah. In the, in the future, I might release like an album or something <laughs> that's, that's called Remember the Tiger Fur. Oh. Because that's... <laughs> One, pho, like, yeah, for everyone now, it's a noodle. Oh, no, no, not, so, not, right? I'm not. Pho? It's not the pho that you're no, talking I don't, about? No, I don't even remember what I was, what I was dictating, but okay. it mistranslated it into, into remember the, the tiger fur. Pho or fur? Like the, uh, the, the fur. The oh, fur oh, of a okay. tiger. And, you know. <laughs> uh, but the topic was like, what role does a designer have in this new app ecosystem yep. of these skills that these virtual assistants use? And I still have a, a very nagging suspicion that there's almost maybe no uh, no room for external apps. I can't imagine that the AI being developed by these corporations wouldn't be able to just get mm. to the point where any appy thing you want to do, it's just figuring out how to do it already in real time based on its artificial intelligence. Like if I was talking to an actual... Uh, I don't know. I guess, I mean, it, it might need access to specific APIs. Like if you wanted to book airplane tickets, it needs to interface with some of course, system yeah, of yeah, buying airplane tickets. The back end, tickets, the system but... is still the same, but it's just the interface has changed into very minimal, like probably just nothing on the screen. And you just use your voice to command it. And such as if you want to drive through McDonald's and your hand is busy, you can start ordering food with, you know, your phone is hanging on your car in your car and you just use your voice to order food. And then the application take care of everything that connect with McDonald's and then you just collect your order. So it's pretty much very it's gonna change the way we design because of AI technology is is like immersive and it's changing the way we design so much. 
that the graphic designer needs to be prepared that, you know, there's not only a button that can give you an action anymore. It's going to be voice with many ways of saying it. So how do you show the interactive on the screen? Uh, it's also something very new. And then for the UX designer, it's going to be about the experience and the strip, the plan, how many scenarios that would happen if they say something funny out of the script. How, how would the, the bot or AI react? Or uh, how many scenarios just to confirm the order, like submit button, click. It's just one button of yes or no, right? But with voice, you can have many ways of saying things. And it's come with emotion. So the hardest thing is the emotion. If you, the user is angry, like why is it taking so long? How does the AI can detect that? And we have to prepare all that scenario in the application. Yeah, yeah I, I, it's a lot see, more complex. I, I still have the suspicion that um, if there was, if this wasn't a thing and I was making an app and I was like, this is going to be a voice-controlled app. Okay. Right? And there's no other voice-controlled apps out there in this fictitious world. I'm just making the first one, right? Oh, wow. In, in that world where I'm making the first voice-controlled app, I have a lot of work to do. Of course, I've yeah. got to come up with all these contingencies. What if they ask, what if the end user asks the app to tell them a joke? What if, what kind of personality should the voice of the app have? Are they aggressive? Are they soothing? Are they, you know, what personality traits do they have? But, like, that's not really the starting point for this stuff. The starting point is Google or yes. Amazon yeah. or Apple. Huge corporations are like, hey, we have this AI and we have this voice stuff. And I wonder down the road to what extent they'll say each app is allowed to have its own personality versus, no, the, the operating system's personality is going to supersede that and all your apps that you interact with will be will have the personality that's been set up in your phone's system preferences, you know, and just globally across the board. Yeah, but isn't it this thing is kind of exciting to you? Like your imagination can really go a lot beyond because creative is about imaginations and also ideas, right? So a lot of things that we are restricted by technology, but think about it, if the technology improved this much, you know, things going to be so exciting in the future. Like every application, like you say, could have their own personality. And then I would say I'm a female. They will give you a female stylist to talk to you in AI, right? And then, and vice versa, like, would be very different way of showing the personality. So I think this is very exciting future that we thinking about. Maybe it's not only 2020, but it could be in the next 10 years, you know? Yeah. I am definitely in need of a personal assistant. So, and me too yeah. for booking schedule. Yeah. I always like mix up my meeting and time. It's so busy. There is this whole host of tasks that I have zero passion to accomplish. Like even if I was to open up Google Calendar and put you in need AI to this, remind you. <laughs> this meeting, which I, I did, I ended up doing uh, because tomorrow's guest requested it. He's, okay. Yeah, he's like, could you please set up a meeting and send me a calendar invite? And I was just like, oh my God. <laughs> I mean, because I haven't done that in, in a long time. Okay. So I have to remember, like, how do I even go about doing that? And if I could have just told my assistant, hey, uh, set up a, a, yeah. it's so an appointment tomorrow for this time, yeah. and it's just done. That's fantastic. Yeah, a lot of us as a UX UI designer is afraid to be out of job in the future where it's all being replaced with AI. And maybe the AI can even do the design work. So what can we do, right? Like what can human do? So I think we go a bit too deep or like beyond the topic of, of the entrepreneurships and things. But I think it's a very interesting area that we want to be the pioneer. We want to be uh, one of the first ones who trying to push this through and educate the market where uh, they should see the importance of design. It's not only about aesthetic. It's also about their uh, data and strategy and also like proven research and they should see the performance of their work not only because I feel personally I think it's beautiful I have like you know Asian client they kind of believe that the color should suit their personal horoscope or whatever like if I'm uh, if I born in this year, yellow is not good for me or good for me, something like that. But it should all about data and science also that proven that this is good. 
Why is it not good? It's because you see the real data. So we want to kind of uh, reshape our strategy to be more focused on things like this. So it's helping to bridge the gap between design aesthetic and also business strategy. So this is the thing that, yeah, so this we is, wanna- This is something that you're, at your for, agency you're focusing on. Yeah, we haven't been doing this for a, a long time, but this recent year, I kind of reshaped and want to move towards that direction because I think that it will also, because we learn from the past of our past work and we have a statistic and we think that this is going to be the future for our agency to kind of reshape and rebranding. So one of the next topic that we're going to cover for next year event of, at Creative Drinks is about rebranding. So every corporation and company after eight to 10 years, they should look at rebranding themselves and including BCA Studio as well. Mm. We're going to rebrand ourselves to be more refreshed and more updated with technology and also the strategy. So that's our future plan. I'm, I'm always, I mean, I, I shouldn't necessarily say this because as a designer, as designers, certainly getting the opportunity to do a rebranding project can be very exciting. And to have that extra income also is, is nice as well. Yeah. But whenever I see a rebranding project, I'm always disappointed. Yeah, yeah. So people can hate your rebrand, right? Like this should come with a reason behind why people decide to rebrand, like the marketing reason. Or, you know, like Facebook recently also have that rebranding and a lot of conflict and opinion. So I think it's 50% of the rebranding is come with a business decision, like why you think you're at the point, company at the point they need to rebrand. And then it's come with aesthetic later, like after. Like, so I think if personally, if you feel disappointed, then there a lot of people might be agree with you because they are so used to the old image that is so attached to it. It's so hard for them to accept something new and different with the brand that they love. So we do branding. We, we kind of understand that. There's definitely companies where they made their branding really early on and it's not sophisticated. Yeah. The, um, the first Apple computer uh, logo was like a detailed illustration yeah, of Isaac colorful. Newton sitting under... No, before the... Oh, like, even before that. Yeah, okay. it was a... Like Isaac Newton sitting underneath an apple tree with like exactly, an apple falling very on him. Realistic. <laughs> yeah, it's a very like an etched drawing, and it's not something that you can just put on the back of a. Uh, exactly. Yeah. You know, it's not something you can just put on the back of a device and have it be iconic. It wasn't an icon. Um, so, in that case, to go from that to a simplified apple, at, less simplified at the time because it had stripes of color. Uh, was, a, I think, a good rebrand. And then to go from those stripes of color to this, uh, I don't even know what the right word would be, but just this solid Rose shape. Go. Oh, you, know, you mean this, the shape, yeah. Flat icon kind of Is shape? Um, the kind of retro nerdiness of me kind of misses that 80s aesthetic of the, of the uh, previous logo, but... It's a brand purpose, right? Like if your brand is all about retro, vintage items, it's so weird for you to do this. But with Apple, it's about technology and it's revolving every and decade. Lifestyle is changed, too, and right? lifestyle too, right? So something minimal and modern would suit them. And the thing, as a branding person, right? The thing that we admire Apple is that they don't promote their brand, but they promote the whole lifestyle. Like you become so cool they solve your internal emotion needs. Like everyone want to be cooler. Like I want to be like stylish, trendy, ahead of people. Then I'm using Apple products. So I'm using Apple products because I'm cool. It's not because I need a laptop only, you know. So they're starting with selling a computer, but they, now they're selling a whole lifestyle. So that's what brand branding and the brand uh, is actually been loved by many people. So th there's some... Uh so I think that's an example of successfully rebranding twice. Um, but there's other companies, big companies, where I, I did not appreciate the rebrand. And even after this time, even now that 10 plus years have elapsed since the rebranding, uh, I'm still not a fan. So things like AT&T or, mm. or UPS. Okay. Uh, AT&T is a yeah, phone company in, in, a, in the US, United States. Yeah. The new logo and the old logo, they, there's a, there's similarities. 
you know, you can feel, oh, yeah. I can feel how it's like that. But it's just in both these cases, they went with um, almost like a material design. It's like they did those redesigns during the time that Mac OS had glossy buttons on everything. So they changed their logos from things that were more iconic to things that like had um, glossy layers on top of them. Okay. You know? All right. Same with the UPS one. Like they took it from something that was a little bit more rigid and formal and mm. they kind of made it more casual, a little bit more curvy and glossy, a little bit more uh, 3D. Well, I mean, I'm sure that it's come with a reason. So everything is behind the brand. It's all about their positioning and who they are communicating with, who's their audience, and also why. what is the brand personality. So it's revolving if their business direction and the personalities kind of change. So I guess the rebranding is always linked. The logo is just the final image, like mm -hmm. the products that you see, but it's all behind the scene where there's a business reason why they do that. Yeah, so I believe that's why aesthetic is very personal, you know, like uh, I like it, you might not like it. But if you read the whole brand story or rebrand story, you kind of feel it makes sense for them to go this way rather than the other way, you know. That's why I always like to read all the story behind all this rebranding. Yeah, I think it's a very interesting topic that we need like hours to cover. <laughs> well, V, uh, we got off on quite a tangent of voice user interface and branding and rebranding and how that might be affecting the strategy of your company moving forward. Yep. I, if you don't mind me asking something slightly more on the personal side, like sure. how did you deal with your mother not being supportive in the early stages of you trying to do your own business? Well, I mean, I was young and of course, any ladies at the young age, they kind of get easier to get emotional about things. So, you know, separate emotion and work was very hard for me back then. Like, So, of course, if you don't have enough emotional support from your parents, especially your mom who you're close to in Asia, we very value family, uh, it will f you will feel very lonely and pressure. So that's how I feel at the beginning. And also I get very uh, connect with my team member because we are very, not many people in the company. So I get very close with them. And if any time they decided to leave the company, I get really sentimental and really sad. I was like, oh my God, I see them like my brother and you know, they're leaving me. So this is just very honest sharing as a woman. Uh, it took me years to get over it. And to also learn to separate some uh, my emotion and my work. And also I believe that for my parents is, uh, I know they still love me and I still love them, but uh, I, I'm very firm about what I should do. So it takes time for me to prove to them that I can make it, I can do it well. And it's rather been now that I'm doing it than I'm just trying to make them happy for a short term and I would, feel very regretting that I couldn't try something that I really like to do in the long term. And then I might end up, you know, kind of have a resentment with my parents because they kind of, the reason that, because for them, I stopped doing things that I like. Uh, so it was a challenge. But as, as a lady, if you're growing older and wiser, people say that, you kind of know that it is the, it's the path that every girl needs to go through to grow up from being very emotional to being at the more stable stage of emotion and separate your work with what you feel. It's not about feeling, yeah. And so in your business practice, have you felt yourself becoming less emotional as each year passes? Uh, I would say I will still have... Uh, I think that's why it's unique about being a female entrepreneur and the owner that you still have this kind of sentimental and connection with your team but you kind of learn to take it easier like take it more easy like more positive side maybe you know something happened it's not because that they doesn't like you it's just that it's better for the future or it's if the client doesn't like our work I shouldn't get days being upset and trying to find, figure out why 
they don't like my work because you know I put a lot of heart and thought into my work. But because it's just not aligned with their business strategy, or it's just simply they want things their way, you know, and our proposal doesn't fit what they like. So, you know, I just move on with that and focus more on the result, the reality that, you know, I'm still meeting the objective of my business plan and the client is still satisfied with the work, even though it's not 100% what we actually propose. But it might work better when you see their sales come going up and it's aligned with their business strategy. So be cool about it. So, yeah, that's, uh, but I don't think um, we care for the staff. And then I'll care for people around me and everyone. Uh, still the same, but I just trying to express it differently. Instead of having a lot of emotion in the way I talk, I would rather show um, more generic sentences or kind of giving them uh, like a result, as in like a bonus or you know a retreat or something happier than uh, I was just putting a lot of pressure on them with all my you know sentences that have a lot of emotion to connect with it so that's the lesson that I learned and uh, it was some of the mistake I made in the past with some of the team member that I get really attached to them that I feel that they're very important to the company and uh, I learned to you know adapt and fix those mistakes over the years and some of them was my first employee and then they came back and they really appreciate my uh, the time that with my company and they know that it wasn't easy to work with me back then, but as I'm being like a bit more demanding and perfectionist, they kind of learn and then they move on to that environment. Everyone thinks that they're good. So I feel very proud to kind of push them to their next level of the career. So, and they come back and appreciate it. Of course, there'll be like bad, bad, bad breakup as well, but in the end, whatever they learn and achieve in the future, if they still remember one of the first boss that they have and come back then this is something i'm very proud of myself yeah as you've as your company has uh well again you've been doing bca for like eight years now so during that time i'm sure there's points where it's gotten bigger potentially times when it's gotten smaller exactly yeah um when you i'm i'm kind of curious about like the times it's gotten smaller Ah, oh, right. Like, would that be a situation where you lost a big client or you weren't able to get enough new clients and you had to let people go? Or was it just that people had quit and you didn't rehire? Like, what is there any kind of um, details in? Yeah, I mean, there's a downtime, uptime and downtime. The reason we scaled down two years ago and I kind of uh, split the business separately between the design agency and the web development agency is because I realized that uh, I was a bit too ambitious with the technology. Like running a development house is not as straightforward as a design agency, right? So I need to have good partner in the tech area that I can rely on. And, you know, managing the tech isn't something that my passion. And I got a lot of stress, a bit of stress dealing with the situation where our product didn't deliver to the certain level that the, the client and I expect. And it's putting a lot of pressure on my uh, tech manager. And he's also my partner, right? And I rather don't want to lose the relationship. But also back then, I had to be really like making decision of, you know, what should be done at that time to keep the image of the company and keep the client happy. So uh, I didn't realize that stress is kind of uh, affecting my life so much that I have like a big health problem broke down back then and I have to step back. Because I had to step back, I couldn't manage such a big team anymore, so I kind of have to reduce and split it with my partner. Uh, and, you know, now after two years I'm back, I kind of learned to be more work-life balance. It was, a, it was a painful experience, but, uh, you know, it helped you get stronger and grow. And then you learn to adapt and changing your business model when it's, things go wrong and rather than you keep dragging it on and you get lost, you got more loss and then you should turn your business model around and kind of move on with a better solution for yourself and your life. Yeah. Mm. Um, how would you, um, when you're interviewing or hiring junior designers today versus 
two years ago, four years ago, six years ago, eight years ago? Have you seen any change in、um, new graduates or junior designers within that time? Yeah, I see a lot of improvement. It's a very good thing for our industry because you know back then. Of course, especially in UX/UI design, is a lot of self self taught and self training, and graphic too. And I see the big gap. The problem is、uh, the foundation of the education here.、Uh, a lot of designer coming to our company lack of their basic principle, design principle, and skills. Until now, they still you know a bit here and there, but it got improved a lot because of the thanks to the internet technology and the designers are very eager to self learn and self taught, so they they learn online. They kind of get more access to international materials online and the trend and websites such as Behance or you know like Triple and all these sites have kind of have more international. Uh, design showcase that they can learn from. So our designer now has a lot more modern taste that cl- a lot closer to what we want for our clients, and so it makes our life a bit easier that they already understand more international style and have better design principle. So the training effort at the beginning for a startup or like small agency will be a lot lesser than、uh, before. You know, you're ask you're saying.、Um, Earlier, you hope that we can provide some value from this podcast.、Mm. You know this particular episode. So, do you have any ideas of like what would give value to the the, the potential audience? Because some of the ideas, I'm like, okay, like what would be your advice for young designers, or what would be your advice for、uh, people interested to start their own company、mm-hmm. anywhere in the world? Like, if you just want to start a business. Or、okay. is there something specific to starting a company in Vietnam that people should pay、mm. attention to, or you know? Yeah, I mean, I think the thing that I can、uh, associate of you know connect with the most is that I'm a female, and I want to share with other women out there who ever thought of starting her own business. I would recommend or encourage them to actually go for it, like pursue their dream. Even if they don't know what to do at the beginning, they can start with something small. But you know, always have the confidence to give it a try because even if you fail, you learn a lot. And who knows, you might be really successful. But if you never try, you never know. So you don't have to start at such a young age. Even at you are like thirty, forty, it's never late to start something. So I just want women here to feel more confident. And there will be a lot of people out there who would love to support you. And you know, in in Vietnam, we are really a nice country where people are helping each other. So there will be a lot of help. I started with no zero connection, and then people just helping me, recommend me to other people, and then I grow my business and connection along the years. So I believe that there will be great opportunity for any other ladies in particular, and any other entrepreneurs to start their business in Vietnam. Okay, it's、Vietnam、a very friendly, yeah. It's a very friendly environment、You've、for you. You spent、uh, a significant amount of time in Korea and South Korea, I guess, if it matters to make that distinction. Yep. And Singapore. Yep. Singapore is because that's where you did your studies, yeah, right? Yeah. Yeah. But why South Korea? Oh, it's interesting because、uh, we used to have an accelerator, and we partner with a lot of startup in Korea, and Korea. Seeing Vietnam as the next go-to market, so they started a few two years ago. It was Indonesia for Korean, and now they're kind of moving to Vietnam. So we are in their radar, right? So we would partnership with them. They send a lot of startups to to us to incubate, and we help them to rebranding and also localize their business in Vietnam. So that's why I get to know a lot of startup founders, and then、uh, I kind of go into Korea to explore the market. And how to see how I can work with the、uh, Korean companies to bring more of them into Vietnam, and I still collab collaborate with them on a very selective have level because I think there's a lot of challenge in terms of lang- language and culture,、mm. and also、um, I think a lot of products model in Korea might not work in Vietnam yet, and so therefore it will be very it's still a long term plan for me to kind of establish ourselves in、uh, in Korea. Yeah. 
But uh, um, I was a little, a little surprised when you say that some Korean products might not do well in Vietnam yet because isn't Korea super trendy in Vietnam? Yeah, like, like people I think, look up to the K-pop idols exactly. and so on. But there's a lot of tech company that come into Vietnam providing hardware solution, providing such as parking solutions and a lot of AI identity and blockchain. So all these technologies are very ahead for Vietnam. So it will take time to adapt to the market. So I guess like certain things that will move a lot slower for them if they go to Vietnam. And with the mentality of the Korean culture, everyone is kind of sharing very similar interests and hobbies. While Vietnamese are very unique, they have many segments and everyone's are very different. Like uh. in Korea, I noticed if someone with the trend, creating the influencer, create that trend, everyone has the same kind of makeup. Everyone follow the same style and it's very similar color. It's a lot easier for business to target mass where everyone is kind of following similar things, similar interests and hobby. Where in Vietnam, like in fashion business, they have so many segments that you can not imagine that how to serve this mass market, right? So I have consulted with a lot of Korean startups about the differences between Vietnam market and Korea. And it's kind of giving me that more understanding because I talk with them, I interview them. They ask me for opinion about Vietnam market and how they should localize their products. Yeah, so I learned a lot over like the past few years being the external mentor for a few accelerator here. Yeah. Well, that's exciting. Um I know, I think the it will be very long to share the journey and if we have another day to do it, yeah, it would we'll, would we'll never be enough. Yeah. B, thank you for taking the time to uh, chat with us this afternoon. No, oh, it's my pleasure. And thanks for the invite to the Creative Drinks event the other night. I appreciate that. Yeah, I hope to do it more often in the future. And I hope to see you there as well. Like You have one of the very challenging questions to our speakers. But uh, it's really, you know, create the tension there and it's good. <laughs> we got to dig deep. You know, to find know, what right? is this the, is all about the core of the knowledge. And, yeah, and, like we discuss, we challenge each other. V, thank you for taking the time to talk with us today and share your experience. My pleasure. Uh, if you'd like to learn more about Studio BCA, uh, the Vietnamese name again is Bo Công An. And if I was to say that with an American accent, <laughs> that's Studio Bo Công An. You're almost there, like 80% correct. You know? So B O C O N G A N H. A N H. Uh, you can find them on Facebook and at studio bokongan.com. Yeah, perfect and pronunciation. In the description below, there'll also be a link to V's uh, LinkedIn profile. Yeah, thank you, Thomas. Thank you very much. And. Um, Please like and subscribe. Follow us on YouTube and on your favorite podcasting application. Thank you. Bye-bye. <laughs> <laughs>